Hi. Hopefully Facebook Live is working. Hard to tell sometimes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Carl. Thank you all for being here with me on Facebook and live this afternoon slash evening, depending on where you are. I want to read some work that hasn't been published, which I wrote in the 10-year period between 2005 and 2015. I spent that 10 years working on my parenting. I have two awesome teenagers and struggling with what you might call writer's block, but which I think of as a kind of crisis of faith in language. I've loved and treasured language all my life and long devoted myself to developing skill in all its various aspects, thinking, speaking, writing, reading. But I've also come to realize this, language is dangerous. It's dangerous because it allows us to exchange the real for the represented and then to mistake those representations for reality. It allows us to invent fictional worlds and then believe in the fiction so strongly that we fail to apprehend the damage we're doing to the real actual world and the living beings that depend on our not damaging it, including ourselves. I've been doing a bit of reading about the neurology of learning and creativity and to make a long story short, I think our cultures are throwing our brains dangerously out of balance in favor of the left hemisphere, which is the side that controls speech and processes the denotative aspects of language, but which has trouble detecting when its own rationalizations are false, and trouble understanding that living beings are whole and present, and not just an abstract collection of parts that can be taken apart and put back together again. I could use up all of our time talking just about that, but suffice it to say that my way back into writing was as an attempt to rebalance my mind, to re-emphasize the role of the right hemisphere through, for example, writing about my dreams, which have a strong right brain tilt. So I'll be reading some of those mixed in with some other traces and artifacts of my process over that decade. <clears throat> in the beginning, but there can't really be a beginning, because for that you need time, and we really have no time to waste or otherwise, as Gerdel blew Einstein's mind by proving. Actually, Gerdel showed that Einstein himself had implied that there is no time. Einstein hadn't meant to imply any such thing, so you, you can imagine how blown his mind was when Gödel proved that the universe described by the general theory of relativity, which Einstein had definitely meant to write, is incompatible with the existence of time. Anyway, so there's no such thing as real time, but there are certainly such things as playtime and story time. This I shall prove by engaging in a bit of each, and I invite you to join and participate as you see fit. Jupiter sold himself short. The old goat insisted on running the weed whacker all weekend. Once a mango fell on his head. His bellow of rage emptied the North Sea. By the time the noise reached Asia, it sounded like a sitar. A man eating a grand slam at Denny's slipped into enlightenment with a disorientation reminiscent of the transporter from Star Trek. Relax. Contact buzz is good. It lends itself to you. It tends toward a two. Sends a new you forward. I'm occasionally able to linger intentionally in the transition state between dreaming and waking. This realm, which feels something like a foyer or corridor, appears to my inner eyes as a kind of energy field. The sky is composed of infinite, shimmering, vibrating, color-changing points of light, suggesting infinite potential dream realities that might be explored. Several times each night, the choice of dream realities must be offered here and made. Something analogous probably happens several times each day as well, if one could develop the capacity to sense it. Yes, one wants some tension, 
when one has the answer. Ann Waldman told me in a dream in a cafe in North Beach and Waikiki, reading into the street where we sat. History weave, heartbeat V clock, brace yourselves for a lifetime, throw me a timeline. We're on a hiking trail, watching and listening as our guide points out a symbiote growing on some poison ivy, a flower itself toxic, with cupped upward curling petals, with spiked tips that obscure a big round flat face. This flower is called Maui Alarm Clock. It took a minute for my clock radio to pull me out into the waking world the other morning. It was playing, some breeze makes me feel fine. But in the dream world, I heard it as Fella chanting, music is a crime sight, with a backing of ass-kicking Afro-funk. Witness, a non-motionless eye, creating a critical mass for some presence, flowing up the xylophone spine of the tetragrammaton. Jupiter cropped up in the night sky. The lawnmowers had been replaced by goats. It was so quiet you could hear the mangoes ripening on the trees. They don't teach this stuff in the North Sea. A sitar player aided the patron's digestion. They don't have this stuff at the Denny's. At the end of her raga, she played a noise that sounded like the transporter from Star Trek. Anyway, in the beginning, there was infinite darkness and silence. Do you remember? All of you was there, and all of us, too. We had yet to become ourselves, but there we were, nevertheless, just waiting in the silent darkness. I say waiting, but that isn't right. It implies an expectation that something else was possible and would or might happen, but there wasn't that. There were two things, nothing and nothing else. There was only that stillness, let's call it the void, just hanging around. It's still there even now, you know, though you have eyes and ears and a mind that would like to tell you different. If you practice mediation, meditation, for at least 20 minutes a day and keep at it, probably either one is fine, very soon I'll bet you'll be able to peel away all the sensations that typically cover it up and find that inexhaustible silent stillness out of which everything else arises. So not waiting exactly. Nevertheless, if the void is that which is not specified, it's difficult to avoid the notion that it's pure potential, practically pregnant with universes to be brought into being, to continue presently. We collude functively, adding ourselves to the everyday. A glass dries on the rack, a sun shines out from the calendar hanging on the kitchen wall while the unknown sun it conceals continues to pour its heat into the breathing planet. I'm in a classroom learning from a Zen master. He instructs me to perform janitorial tasks in another classroom. I cross the campus lawn, enter a storage room, find the broom, and go into the other classroom. It's something like metal shop with students working away. I sweep the floor and switch out the trash bag, but can't find the dumpster where I'm supposed to put the full one. I go back to my class to report to the teacher and ask where I should throw out the trash bag, and in reply, he instructs me to watch a film. The film is a 1970s style police drama concerning a corrupt officer who's assigned over his objections to lead a murder investigation. 
his first order to his team is to join him in snorting cocaine and drinking vodka, after which a car squeals over the crest of the hill they're standing on, streets of San Francisco style, and he and his men spontaneously explode. Wow, I think, as I awake. I guess it's transcend or consequences. Capital city of mass hypnosis. Vacation hotspot for left hemisphere tip-over sufferers. Faith's pup leaps, does a leash dance down Pele's pile-up through a gathering blather of bees, SUVs, and cox crow. Skyscraper kipuka on the hillsides. Reconsidering the pressure of money against time. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the workaholic dilettante. Dreamed I was being stalked through the city by a ghost bear. I had some kind of energy weapon, but by the time I aimed it correctly, it had lost too much of its charge and just made the bear's image wobble a little. The bear bit me and I woke up to find one of the kitties attacking my feet in the bed. That cat's new nickname is Ghost Bear. An audacious heist. A special tool held against the palm by a cat's cradle and concealed with an oven mitt. A flight up to where the treasure lies hidden. But what is it? Spring a flavor to favor a visitor or two. Green flip and sizzle bold over rice. By day, the stars join together to erase distance and form a light unity we call sun. At night, the sun reconstellates itself, perspectives gathering in dispersal. I enjoy seeing the ships offshore on moonless nights, like tonight isn't. With the ocean invisible, they appear to be floating through the sky. Like Monet painting from Stieglitz skyscapes, the moon's a smeary smutch, illumining clouds, its ocean shadows anamorphic drift. Why does everyone throw out fuzz? I was passing through an alleyway in New York City, and two white men started following me. One had a gun out, although he wasn't threatening me with it. The other had several vials of what I took to be heroin, although visually it resembled mustard seeds. There was a background sense of menace, but they were talking quite charmingly about why I should join their drug dealing venture. I politely declined and they went their own way when I reached my destination. Jupiter Saturnson was the most popular drug dealer on the upper top side. He lived in an abandoned school with four members of his sales staff and a goat one of his customers had traded him. During mango season, the junkies washed up at his door like waves on the North Sea shore in winter. He just smiled his sitar smile at them. They always said his stuff opened your brain like the transporter from Star Trek. No one can say when the silence gave rise to music. Indeed, perhaps the silence and the music are one and the same, and it's only sense organs and nervous systems that enable there to be a distinction between them that we've mostly committed ourselves to making. But whatever the cause, gradually or all at once, the realization dawned that everything together was making the most exquisite music. From the water falling through the clouds and coursing through the streams and rivers to the lakes and seas, to the volcanoes crafting new land, to the plants growing and the animals swimming, flying, crawling, and so forth. And you can imagine with Pythagoras and Tolkien right out to the planets, stars, and galaxies singing their parts as gravity conducts them around in space. Language. Song flow freezer, a sheet to paper over, meaning stripped to its meanest. Go back to singing it, or rather come around to re-singing it. Meaningfulness fill up, 
burn away the residue, melt it back to music. There is the light that never goes out. Yes, but there's another one that always goes out. So I have a nightmare about being in an argument so heated I fall out a third story window. Over the years, I've overcome the inability to scream in my dreams, so I wake up screaming. After finally getting back to sleep, I wind up in a bar with Morrissey, who's being targeted for assassination by the mob because they've decided he's an FBI informant. The Moz is kicking Hitman ass, too. Then I'm in a junkyard in a desert at night, walking out to where my friend Ambika is creating a sand sculpture of Ganesha. It's about 10 feet tall, amazingly detailed, and a bit magic. When I touch the trunk, some of the sand collapses, but the moving sand simply forms itself into a smaller, slightly different, but just as detailed trunk. Suddenly, there's an emotionally disturbed man in our midst, shouting and swinging a shovel-like implement. The professor had structured his final as a scavenger hunt. You had to do part of the final and then find the next part. A thoughtless joke hit too close to home, and there was a heartfelt apology. It was discovered that humanity was mutating into cannibalistic monsters to reduce the population so the planet's resources would sustain the remainder. There was only enough left for 12 of the monster people. Disease outspends cure three to one. Precipitating fairies announce your infinity. Their voices sing in my head echoing ceaselessly like sublime insanity. Three times I returned to the foyer of dreams. All the worlds shimmered in its energy net. My mouth so dry it nearly woke me. But swallowing, I leapt into the net and soared into the next iteration. Speaking of which. Jupiter was once covered in fuzz, not woolly like a goat, but soft like a peach. The mango doesn't enter into it. I'm in a school library near the end of the day. There's a large book, maybe three feet by five feet on a table. The book is very old and has broken binding. The librarian offers to let me take it, but I decline. A short time later, walking outside, I become aware that I'm in the company of a tiny bird about the size of a table grape or a carpenter bee. It will rest on my shoulder or neck and then periodically fly around, its green, blue, and red feathers a blur. I don't want to remove it from what I assume is its home here on the campus, so I gently try to remove it from my neck, thinking to set it in a tree or something but I notice that when it's on me, it doesn't seem to have feathers, being more like a gummy bird. It's very difficult to peel off my skin, and I realize that this is because it's clinging to me, terrified. So I stop trying to remove it and let it stay. Trying to figure out what to do, I have a sudden hunch about the book in the library. Returning with the bird, I stand in front of the book again, and the bird hops off of me, its feathers returning, and into the book. It has indeed made a nest for itself in a hollowed out space in the broken binding. I find the librarian and tell her I'll take the book after all and set about carefully lifting it to bring it home. Sky-minded, tree-bodied, cloud-cradled, the driplets tumble drop down rain, in rhythmic precision are star-flung, star-scatter. When turning, the urban emerges, outwailing, its mechanized siren comes cleaving, then tidally, tidally, recedes and returns, cloud-shrouded, cloud-cradled.
mountain mother, the mouth of an other. You, a cup the sky pours into, peaked at each end, and in the middle, two cross-mounted, at the start an eye lifts itself in the mind's self to the top, at the end is half of what began. And then I'm going to finish with a set of um, pieces that I pulled from writing uh, exercises, warm-up exercises that I would do. So these are unused titles or band names. Fried Green Party, Yave's Beard, The Pint-Sized Clues, The Fortunate Nuns, Golly G Apocalypse, Crescendo of Cow Manure, Parliament of Jowls, Enough of your Sephardic nonsense, just get me a cuppa, Packet of Obviousness, Snark Elevator, Revenge of the Meek, Tardy Circumspection, Expector Gadget, The Sleepwalking Explosives, Rubbish Continuum, Fetishized Pollinator Selfies, Fraternal Order of Fries, Asymptotic Hottie, Costume Belittler, Token Paranoiac, Cantilevered Mustache, Mistaken Barber Practicum, Bossa Nova Scotia, Crouching Spider, Hidden Cockroach. Thanks. <clears throat> so, um, so that's the reading part. Um, so, if you want to bail now, uh, I will not be offended. But um, for those of you who are interested, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how I put together this um, reading, this set of uh, p the material that I read. Um, it was originally assembled for a reading that I was invited to do in 2014. I was invited in 2014. The reading was actually in March of 2015 by Susan Schultz, the uh, poet and uh, at the time was editor of Tinfish magazine. She's currently the editor emeritus of Tinfish magazine. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, um, I had not written any poems really in the 10 years uh, preceding that invitation, um, although I had, was struggling with it, I had written some things, but not really. I had not really finished many pieces, and um, there, I had a lot of just kind of fragmentary stuff and exercises and things that I was trying to do to get myself out of my writer's block. Um, so uh, after I got the, after I accepted the invitation, I went into a uh, sort of a low-key panic. <laughs> Um, because I uh, don't like to um, read the same material um, more than once in a city if I can help it. And, you know, I'd lived in Honolulu at that point for, um, I lived in Honolulu for about seven years um, since the last time I had read, and I had given probably half a dozen readings in that time, so I had pretty much used up all of my older material. Um, so I contacted Susan, you know, asked, how long do you want me to read for? And she said, well, I was gonna, we worked it out. There's going to be three readers. Uh, audiences get kind of tired if you, you know, try to make them sit still for longer than an hour. So 15 to 20 minutes. So I went and looked through all my books and all my folders online and uh, looked through everything and um, started pulling out anything that um, I thought would be usable. Um, you know, uh, poems, uh, short stanzas, uh, phrases, words, <laughs> um, and pa pairs of words, anything that 
um, I thought would be usable and went and typed it all up and uh, um, printed it out, cut it into little bits, all, cut it up all into little fragments and just assembled all the fragments and in front of me and tried to um, tried to assemble them into little clusters of things that um, you know resonated with each other or had associations with each other and um, you know throughout the things that didn't feel like they were working I, uh, I went went through it and rewrote some things um, you know read through it all um, realized that I actually had too much which I was surprised at um, so started throwing more things out um, uh, read through it again a couple times and tried to figure out if there were better ways of arranging the material. At some point I hit on the idea of um, doing it a little bit like side two of Abbey Road and um, you know rather than uh, reading like all the dream poems in one chunk and all of the you know um, writing prompts in another one and reading the finished poems in one chunk I would kind of um, break it all up and make it into one long 15 to 20 minutes um, sort of medley and and break up the the pieces that were um, originally together so that they kind of made um, loops through the the course of the, the reading um, and uh, so wound up um, going, taking it that way, and there were a couple of um, actual finished poems that were in multiple stanzas, and I actually wound up fragmenting those um, to, to you know, integrate them into the larger whole. Um, so that's what I ended up doing, um, and so that's how the whole thing ended uh, ended up the way it was. So. Um, so I was going to answer some questions uh, at the end of this, but the uh, I, the only one that I see here is show us your baseball cards. So, <laughs> and I'm not going to do that, Jeff. <laughs> but thank you for asking. <laughs> and um, so thank thank you all for showing up and and watching and listening to this. Um, and for anybody that's going to watch this later, um, thank you from the past, <laughs> um, which is where what I'm speaking to you from. And uh, I, I hope to do this again, um, so uh, stay tuned. And um, I, for those of you out there who are do creative work or work of any kind that um, that you feel like sharing, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I would love to see what other people are doing. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Yay.